on the 25th of August in the year 1227, at Junrung, a little south of the Great Wall of China in Shenzi province, Genghis Khan, creator of one of the greatest empires in world history, died whilst leading his army on another campaign of conquest. On his deathbed, the Khan told his courtiers, I die without regrets, but my spirit wishes to return to my native land. After a brief period of mourning, his corpse was therefore carried in state across the desolate steppes of Asia to his homeland in Mongolia, where he was buried on a mountain spur. But every living thing that crossed the procession's path was slain, with the words, depart for the next world and there attend upon your dead lord. Death and terror played a central role in the mighty Mongol Empire. What kind of man could demand such a sacrifice even in death? Who was Genghis Khan? To answer this question, it's necessary to look at the geography of Asia. This vast continent may be said to fall into four divisions. The northern forest or taiga, the steppe or prairie grassland, the vast and arid desert, and the river valleys of the south, Huangho and Yangtze. Ganges and Indus, Euphrates and Tigris, which have provided the lifeblood of the great civilizations of China, India and Persia. Genghis Khan came from the second of these divisions, the steppe lands, that vast area of prairie grassland that extends from Manchuria to Hungary and is the home of the pastoral nomad. Little has changed in the lives of the people here in the 800 years since the birth of Genghis Khan. Then, as now, the nomad lived by raising animals, mainly horses and sheep, wandering from place to place with his herds in pursuit of the grass and the seasons. His livelihood, his herds of livestock, his home, a felt tent or yurt, and his family all moved with him. There could be no walls for defense. Security depended on constant vigilance, mobility, and readiness. Once the nomad had adopted the horse, the stirrup, and the bow, he became the horse archer, the most formidable cavalryman until modern times. None of the skills perfected then has been lost to his descendants, in spite of the passing of the centuries. Life on the vast, open steppes of Asia can be hard and often cruel. Summer lasts just three short months, when, from June to August, the steppe blossoms in a carpet of grass and flowers. For the rest of the year, blizzards and ferocious winds sweep the bare plains. These conditions and the contest for the best grazing lands would set one tribe against another. Waves of horsemen would appear out of the steppe to plunder the fields and cities of their sedentary and civilized neighbors. Periodically, a leader of more than usual ability would succeed in subjecting a large number of tribes to his will, and nomadic empires rose and fell with astonishing swiftness. One such leader was Temujin, who later became known as Genghis Khan. Temujin was born in or around the year 1167, the son of the chief of the Mankhol tribe from which the Mongols take their name. In spite of the fact that his father was murdered by rivals, he somehow survived and established himself as leader of a small clan of his own. 
Temujin was then able to extend his authority over more and more Mongol clans, until in 1206, at a Kuriltai, or assembly, held on the banks of the river Onon, Temujin was proclaimed Supreme Khan of all who dwelt in tents of felt, and given the name Genghis Khan, Prince of All Between the Oceans. Nevertheless, his palace was still a nomad's tent, and from it, the great Khan set out to conquer the rich, sedentary societies that lay beyond the steppe and the desert. His avowed aim was to conquer the world. He began with China. China was divided at this time between two empires, the Qin, with their capital at Peking in the north, to the south, the Sung, with their capital at Hangzhou. The Qin themselves were nomads from the north who had crossed the Great Wall less than a century before and pushed the Sung back beyond the Yellow River. In 1211, it was the turn of the Qin to come under attack from the steppes. The Mongols made a series of raids deep into the territory south of the Great Wall. A more systematic plan was then devised, with three separate armies advancing into Qin territory. At first, they found the defences of the main towns unassailable. The walls of Peking stretched 18 miles. They were 40 feet high and 40 feet thick, with 900 towers to strengthen them. But Genghis created a corps of engineers skilled in siege craft from captured Chinese prisoners. The result? was that Peking was closely blockaded and fell in 1215. The palaces and public buildings were looted and burned. Many of the inhabitants were massacred. Peking was the first of many populous capitals to feel the savage fury of uncivilized nomads who feared and hated a way of life they could not understand. The dream of becoming master of all China obsessed Genghis for the rest of his life. But after the fall of Peking, he decided to lead his armies towards the west, to the Islamic state of Khwarizm, which stretched from the Caspian Sea to the Pamir Mountains and from the steppe to the Indus, and which had expanded considerably under its ambitious ruler, Muhammad Shah. In 1218, Genghis demanded that Muhammad should acknowledge him as great Khan and overlord. When Muhammad refused and murdered the Mongol ambassadors, Genghis took the offensive and commenced a three-year campaign of sustained devastation, during which most of the Khwarizmian towns were totally destroyed. At Bukhara, for example, which the Mongols reached in 1220, they first set the wooden buildings on fire and drove the inhabitants as cover to attack the citadel. Fire bombs and rocks were hurled in. Assaults of increasing ferocity were launched against the walls until at last the citadel was taken. The 30,000 defenders were slaughtered and their women and children taken as slaves. All buildings were razed to the ground. Finally, the great Khan climbed into the pulpit of the city's mosque and delivered a sermon to the surviving population. O oh people, know that you have committed great sins. If you ask me what proof I have for these words, I say it is because I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed great sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. Genghis remained in the West until 1223, mopping up local resistance. It was his last effective campaign. He invaded China again in 1226, but he was already an old man and seriously ill. He died the next year at the age of 73.
as an empire builder, Genghis ranks with Alexander the Great and Napoleon. In 20 years, he had extended his rule from the Pacific Ocean to the Caspian Sea. How had he managed it? In the words of the chronicler Juveni, the troops of the great Khan were more numerous than ants or locusts, being in their multitude beyond estimation or computation. Detachment after detachment arrived, each like a billowing sea. A more reliable account was given by a Persian historian, Rashid Adin, who compiled his world history around the year 1300. It's from his original manuscript that these magnificent contemporary miniatures are taken. There were many reasons for Genghis' success. The Mongols were masters of subterfuge. Sometimes they stampeded riderless horses into the enemy to confuse them. Sometimes they tied stuffed sacks to their horses to appear more numerous. They were masters of the feigned withdrawal, luring the enemy into ambush. Lightly equipped, fast moving, agile and efficient, they were able to cover 200 miles a day. The Mongol rules of war were simple. Those who surrendered instantly became their slaves. Those who did not were massacred. After the defeat of a Christian army in Hungary in 1241, an eyewitness reported, during a march of two days, you could see nothing along the roads but fallen warriors their dead bodies lying about like stones in a quarry. He might have added that the heads of their enemies were used in the building of the Mongols' own gruesome beacons to warn off further attacks. That, however, lay in the future. After Genghis Khan's death, his successors were determined to complete the conquest of China. At a general assembly of Mongol leaders in 1229, Genghis' third son, Ogade, was elected Great Khan. He was not an outstanding soldier like his father, nor yet a gifted administrator. He was chosen because his popularity and political skills made his authority acceptable to the numerous and powerful descendants of Genghis. Conquest was left to his generals, and during the reign of Ogade, the frontiers of the Mongol Empire were pushed forward in three directions against the Qin Empire, against the remnants of Khwarizmian power in Persia, and into Europe. The Qin were finally overthrown in 1234, and in the next year, Ogade planned the invasion of Europe, which was to be led by Batu Khan, a grandson of Genghis, who was made viceroy of the westernmost parts of the empire. Batu Khan had at his disposal about 150,000 troops, at this time, no European power could muster much more than 20,000. So there were frenzied attempts by rulers near to the Mongol line of advance to find allies. They were all in vain. The Mongols' first European target was Russia, and a campaign was launched over the winter of 1237-38. The frozen rivers served as highways for the advancing cavalry. The unprepared and disunited principalities of South Russia were unable to offer effective resistance. One by one, they were destroyed. All was laid waste. This achievement is all the more remarkable when we consider the fate of the winter campaigns directed by Napoleon or Hitler, whose troops are seen here in humiliating defeat after being turned back from the very gates of Moscow. The Mongol victory was, in fact, the only successful winter invasion of Russia in history.
the campaign was renewed in 1240 with the storming of the city of Kiev. Kiev was now as desolate as Bukhara or Peking. The same year, a two-pronged assault was launched against Poland and Hungary. The river Oder was passed at Ratibor, and the Mongol army swept northwards up the river valley. Breslau was bypassed, and on the 9th of April 1241, a combined German-Polish army was annihilated at Niknitz. Then the Mongols swept through Buda, Pest, and Gran, nearly reaching Vienna, and then turned south along the Adriatic into Bulgaria. If the Mongol armies had swept onwards across Western Europe as easily as they had across Asia, then the entire history of the European continent might have been different. But disputes arose over the succession after the death of Ogaday in 1241. The result was that Batu Khan turned back and led the armies home to Mongolia. Eventually, Ogaday's ambitious nephew, Manke, was elected Great Khan. It was decided to undertake two new campaigns, one against the Sung Empire in southern China, the other against the Arab states of Mesopotamia and Persia. Manke himself was to take charge of the Chinese war, and the campaign in the west was entrusted to his younger brother, Hulagu. The campaign was planned with the usual Mongol thoroughness, and on New Year's Day 1256, a mighty army made the passage of the river Oxus. The key to the campaign was the capture of Baghdad, which fell after a long siege in 1258. The palace of the Caliph, the Grand Mosque, the tomb of the Abbasids, and other public buildings were burnt. Much of the cultural accumulation of five centuries was destroyed, and a blow was struck at civilization from which it never recovered. But just as Christian Europe was saved by the death of Ogaday in 1241, so the death of Manke in 1259 saved Muslim Asia. An armed conflict broke out between rival claimants for the succession. The army under Hulagu withdrew from Syria for the Mongol heartland, leaving only a skeleton force in the Near East. This soon became known in Cairo. The Sultan of Egypt marched to the defense of Islam. At Ain Jalut, near Nazareth, on the 3rd of September, 1260, the superior Egyptian army inflicted a crushing defeat on the Mongols. This battle was a turning point in history. The spell of Mongol invincibility was shattered. The Mongol westward advance was never seriously renewed. Moreover, the unity of the Mongol Empire really came to an end with the death of Manke. His younger brother Kublai was successful in the struggle for power and was proclaimed the fifth great Khan. But his direct authority appears to have been confined to the east and he exercised only a nominal control elsewhere. The Il Khans of Persia descended from Hulagu, the Golden Horde in Russia, Chagatai, the Mongol heartland, all pursued their separate destinies for over a century. While Kublai Khan spent almost all his long life in China, destroying the Sung Empire in the 1270s and restoring the unity of the Chinese realm once and for all. But whereas Genghis had traveled and pitched his tents all over Asia, Kublai Khan preferred a more permanent abode, although it was still shaped like a tent to which the people of Asia and even beyond could come. He had become, in the words of Marco Polo, the most powerful man since Adam. Marco Polo, a Venetian merchant, was one of the most famous visitors to the court of Kublai Khan, where he spent some 17 years. His descriptions of the bustling Chinese capital, Hangzhou, with its lakes and parks, as well as its million inhabitants going about their business, show that the nomads of the steppes had at last come to see the attractions of a more sedentary life. Kublai Khan provided the acceptable face of Mongol overlordship. It's hard to equate the civilized ruling class of Kublai Khan's China with the rapacious savages portrayed in other Western sources, such as the Great Chronicle of Matthew Paris, 
composed at St. Albans a little before Marco Polo set out on his epic journey. Mongols are inhuman and beastly, rather monsters than men, thirsting for and drinking blood, tearing and devouring the flesh of dogs and men. This was not mere fantasy. The Arab historian Ibn al-Athir waited for many years before writing his history of Genghis Khan because, he told his readers, the events he had seen were too horrible to record. It was, he protested, the greatest calamity that had ever befallen mankind. But the Mongols did not only destroy, later they also created. They gave the Eurasian world almost a century of peace, which permitted the exchange of goods and ideas between East and West on an unprecedented scale. Silver and gold from Europe reached China. Chinese porcelain circulated in Europe. This extremely rare and valuable 13th century Sung Yue may have first traveled across the steppes of Asia in the saddlebags of a camel train as much as 600 years ago. The Mongols' own particular form of blitzkrieg had taken them from their homelands to Korea and the Sea of Java in the east, right the way to Russia and the western shores of the Black Sea in the west. They had ranged from Siberia in the north to the Persian Gulf in the south. Never had a primitive people had such an effect upon world history. And yet, in spite of the greatness of the empire they created, little remains today to remind the world of the might of the Khans. Little, that is, beyond the echo of their names, ringing out across the centuries, over the vast, empty steppes of Asia, borne on the wind, like the pounding hooves of the horses of their descendants. invasions were the last and the most violent assault of nomadic tribesmen that the world was called upon to endure. Changes, such as the invention of gunpowder, would mean that political and military success were no longer the domain of the fast-moving cavalry tribesmen. From the decline of the Roman Empire, marauding hordes had been able to hold vast tracts of the world in terror. No longer would that be possible. A new era was about to begin. <laughs> 